Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10 says this, <clears throat> declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So the Lord says from the end, or declaring the end from the beginning, which tells us when God speaks, he's already seen its completion. Now, this is a very powerful principle because if God is truly talking to you about something and speaks to you, the minute he talks to you, you should consider it over. Even though it's not in manifestation. Because God is not going to say something to you at the beginning that he hasn't already seen its end. <clears throat> This is why when God gives a word to you and you take it by faith, it will come to pass because he's declaring you in a beginning of hearing something already finished. Are you hearing me? You know, as well as I do, when we, uh, when God began to speak to us concerning purchasing the mall, uh, I'll never forget that particular camp, uh, living faith conference that uh, Pastor Kenneth Estrada and Pastor Roddy Schaefer were here, and we had heard the Lord. And so we decided uh, in that service, based upon Pastor preaching on moving mountains, that, and this was in 2015, we didn't sign officially till uh, 2021. Uh, that it became ours. But in 2015, which would have been a January, in 2015, us three, we came over here to this area right here and we began to dance and shout like we had signed papers and it was finished. So the day that I actually signed, I didn't jump around and shout because I had done it six years earlier. Come on, you hear what I'm saying? So that's how it is with God with you. If he says, by his stripes ye were healed, well, then guess what you are? So that means your body must get in alignment as long as you fail not to believe. Amen. Now, there may be some things in the process between your belief and its manifestation that you're going to do some things that's not just God alone. Okay, because God may have some different methods by which he brings that healing to pass. And when I say that, I'm not saying don't continue to hear God in the process, but you never abandon, I can only be healed. I have to walk in wholeness. Because again, Jesus, with some that were, um, didn't have uh, the ability to see, at a word they saw, but with others, he puts mud on their eyes and tells them to go wash it off. With one, he spoke to, and um, I think he may have spit in his eyes or did something, maybe just spoke to him or laid hands on him, and he opened his eyes, and he said, what do you see? He said, well, I see people that look like trees, which means when he opened it, wasn't instantaneous. So the Lord laid hands on him again. The next time he opened, it was crystal clear. Well, you understand that man didn't get mad at God and say, well, how come I didn't get it like blind man Bartimaeus? The problem with believers is sometimes they want their manifestation of healing to be like somebody else's manifestation or their manifestation of faith would be a better way, you know, like someone else got, which that's not the point. Do you get the end result? I said, do you get the end result? That's the issue is you want to be able to stay with the end result. So he says he declares the end from the beginning. He says, my purpose will be established. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So then we brought up this because we're talking about uh, the power of the will. Okay, in God's kingdom, okay, there's, there's a power contained within the will. In fact, God's creation has within it a will of its own. And we talked about this last week that there are created beings that are in God's kingdom that he's given them a will and they can choose. And God doesn't stop their choice. Even though he may know their choice will bring death. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go online so you can see that even in the realm of angels... There was the capacity or the ability for them to think on their own. 
and one anointed cherub, he was called the morning star in Isaiah chapter 14. Because of his beauty, he got lifted up in pride and he decided that of his own free will, I'm going to take over the throne in heaven. I'm going to take God, the creator of all things, I'm going to take him off his throne. He made a choice. Now, do you think God wanted him to make that choice? Absolutely not. But he allowed him, and he, and he received the consequences of that choice, which means Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven. Right? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Not only did he fall, but a third of the angels with him, which means he was able to convince a third. I said a third. To, to exercise rebellion against the creator of all things. And they were convinced they could do it. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The minute he did that, he gave you a will as well. So when he places man in the garden, he said, let us make man in our image, Genesis 126. According to our likeness, let them have dominion. God has dominion. He has rule. So he gave man rule and dominion on the earth. He describes what it was on the earth that he had dominion over. And then he set a parameter for man to determine, does man love me or not? Now, man should love him because he was created in the nature of God, and God is love. However, love is not known unless love is exercised. So he said, you can eat from any tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for the day you eat, you will surely. What do you think God's will for Adam was? To live, to never, ever eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't you believe that was his will? Do you think the Lord was like, I really want him to die? I'm going to put that tree there because I really don't like him anyway. No, we know it was his will for him to live and be like him. However, Adam had the free will. And you know what the father didn't do? The father did not go against his will. I said the father did not go against his will. He bore the consequence of his decision and love, because God is love, put Adam out of the garden. Put Adam out of the garden. Are you hearing me? So... When we hear this, because again, why are we in this series? Again, just to help connect the dots, right? We started this year out calling the reigning spirit because we have the reigning spirit. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells where? In you. We have the third person of the Godhead. He is the Holy Spirit. He is the reigning spirit and all other spirits are subject to him, right? And if we have the reigning spirit, then why are we listening to other voices? Okay? Because, and because of this whole context, we came out of uh, Timothy, when Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, now listen, in the last of the last days, or in the latter times, he said, the spirit explicitly says, meaning the spirit is saying, this is going to happen. You can't pray away. You can't fast and pray that it's gone. This is going to take place. He said, in the last days... He said, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to doctrines of demons and seducing spirits. So then, it's going to behoove us to understand the realm of the spirit this year, but also understand how we need to keep ourselves connected to the reigning spirit and then attack certain things that are being spoken in the, in our circles, when I say our circles, I'm talking those who call themselves believers, that we need to deal with the cliche statements that have a form of godliness, but it actually lacks power. And not only does it lack power, but it actually has a seduction to it. And if you take hold of certain aspects of things that are just flippantly being said without you examining it yourself to determine it's true, then it can take you down a road uh, to deception that you'll begin to view Scripture through a clouded lens. And be firmly persuaded that you love God and you are doing his intention, all the while the devil has made you powerless. 
and of no significant effect on the earth. Amen? So we are dealing with the power of the will. It is the most powerful force God created. So powerful that he doesn't violate yours. He does not violate your will. But he will hold your will against his. And ultimately, his will wins. Now, he does this not because um, he's making you. He does this because his will is his word and his word is life. And he's giving you the opportunity to submit to life. In fact, Joshua said it this way, which was really powerful, and it just resonates uh, all throughout Scripture. He said, I've set before you life and choose, choose life. But who gets to choose it? Who does? Okay. So if we have the reigning spirit, you have to understand the reigning spirit is not making you do something. And since he's not making you do something, because if God made people do stuff, don't you think he would have made Adam not eat the fruit? Could God had closed his mouth? I mean, we know this happened uh, in the Gospels with, um, um, uh, was it Zachariah, is that his name? Uh, that was, you know, the husband of uh, Martha. And he's like, how in the world my wife going to have a kid now? And the angel's like, bro, you didn't believe my word? Uh, you know, that's Pastor Earl's paraphrase. And he says, because of that, you are not going to be able to open your mouth. Now, he could open his mouth and eat, but he could not talk, which means the Lord caught tied up his vocal cords. That doesn't mean uh, Zachariah couldn't communicate because he could write. He could carry on whole conversations, right? Now, I'm not saying that he started sign language. I'm just saying he could write, ultimately. But when he acknowledged that his son, after he was born, his name would be John, then Lord loosed his vocal cords, and he began to speak again. Well, don't you know that God can shut mouths? Well, we know he actually can shut physical mouths so they don't open up when he did what he, what he did for Daniel in the lion's den. Because you know those, those lions were hungry. I don't believe the, the lions were satisfied where they had no hunger pain. I believe the Lord made them more hungry all night long. In fact, I surmise that when Daniel laid down with the lion that could not eat him, but his stomach was grumbling, it's much like you having one of these beds today that, ha that, uh, that will um, massage you while you're sleeping. So he was being massaged by the rumbles of the lion's stomachs and went to sleep and slept great because the minute they pulled Daniel out and he threw the ones who came against Daniel in, they couldn't even hit the ground. And those lions said, about time we get to eat. We were, we were held 24 hours. My point is, if God is in control like people say, then why did he not shut Adam's mouth or wither his hand? Okay, come on now. Because we know it's God's will that he doesn't eat it. And we know he's all powerful. But he doesn't stop. He doesn't stop him. You know God sees it when he eats. Because when God comes down and says, Adam, where are you? It's not because he was blind. It's not because Adam was a good hider. Right? No, he's like, you're out of position. He's just trying to get him to take responsibility for his action. Have you eaten the fruit? I told you not to. So we need to be careful when we say God's in control because we can mislead people. In fact, I'll just be honest with you. There was a whole article written by someone at one juncture who was having a hard time with God and Jesus.
because they had heard the statement, God's in control so much, that says, well, if God's in control, he's doing a really horrible job right now. Because why are there famines? Why are there women being raped? Why is there uh, inequality and injustice in nations? Why are there this? If this is God, then I don't want to serve him. And the reality is God is not... Um, um, uh, you know, wanting famine. God is not wanting people to kill each other. God is not wanting women raped. That is not his will. So he's not the author of those actions. Yet we in our illiteracy of scripture and the knowledge of rightly divine the truth will begin to give God a power he himself doesn't even possess to try to justify him as if he's greater because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And if God wants a woman to be raped to teach her something, then that's on God and they ought to just accept it. He is not unjust like that. He's not. Because really the word control means to have power over. Well, does he have power over? Ultimately, his word has power over. Does he exercise restraining or directing influence over? I would say he definitely gives influence. How did he control Adam? The most he could control Adam was this. Adam, see all the trees? You can eat from any of them. Now see this tree right here? Don't eat. For the day you eat, you're going to die. And that's all the control he had over Adam. He was trying to influence him. Because what did he say? This fruit, what did he tell him? Don't eat it. He told him what to do. Don't eat it. He told him what to do. Don't eat it. He told him what to do. Don't eat it. Because the day you do, you'll die. So did God make Adam eat the fruit? No. Nope. Adam chose. Although he had the answer to not. So we've got to be careful when we start saying, well, God's in control. He doesn't control. In fact, let me just go ahead and drive on a little bit so I can prove this to you some things again. God cannot force anyone against their will, but only influences it by giving them the right answer. But ultimately, you decide. Okay? Go ahead and look at your name and say, I decide. Don't be blaming God for all your mistakes. Don't think God willed it. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go there. God will let you do anything you want to do, but will hold you accountable to whatever you do according to his will. Because at the end of the day, what is will? Will is the decision to do. An action, something. And at the end of the day, who has the ultimate say-so in anything? Okay? Now, you say we do. You have the ultimate ability to do anything you want to. But the ultimate say-so is the Lord's. And if you choose not to do it, you get the consequences of not doing it. But it was still your choice. Because he sure didn't make you. Right? Right? How many of you felt forced by the Lord to be here today? How many of you did the Holy Spirit come up out your body, <laughs> snatched your sheets off your bed this morning, threw you out of bed? You're like, what? Get dressed. I don't feel like going today. And you picked your arm, you're putting your jacket on. You're like, I don't want you. And he's brushing your teeth. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go. <laughs> He hits you and you spit the stuff out. And he throws you in the car and he drives for you while you're sitting there hitting the brake. And then he makes you come in today. <sighs> Did he do that? So why are you here? Now, does God want you here? How do you know that? Because it's in his word. Do not forsake the assembling of yourself together and all the more as the day draws near. As some do, they forsake. He said, don't do that. 
And all the more as the day approaches, what day? The day we're waiting on, the day when the trumpet sounds, the day that we are changing the moment in the twinkling of an eye and we jump up out of this place. Yeah, all the more. And if there's ever a day that that day is, it's today. We're closer than ever. We should be the best perfect attendance people on the planet. But that comes by free will. And that's not religion, that's choice. Hallelujah. So will is the power to control one's own actions and emotions. Mental powers manifested as wishing, desiring, choosing, or intending to determine by an act of choice. And we all have this. I had a choice today of what to put on. The Lord did not talk to me and say, put this on. Now, if the Lord told me what to wear, I would put that outfit on. I would do that. But if he didn't, he did tell me this, though, to put on an outfit in a general sense. Why? Because he said that I need to be modest. So coming in here naked would be pretty embarrassing. Right? I mean, that wouldn't be God's will for me to say, I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. I'm back in the garden, people. I'm free. No. No. I mean, I'm not building a doctrine on nudity. Right? Come on now. Now we are all free. We back like the original Adam. We in the garden. We just have a nudist church. I can he see it now. <laughs> I can see them now getting off that bad. I'm not attending, people. I am not attending. I, I have never heard of any nudist colony that the people look good anyway, just to let you know. <laughs> Funny story. Funny story. So I have a pastor friend of mine who used to be a district director for Rama out in the Tampa area, and he had a, a person in his church that said, hey, uh, my mom or my father, one of those, I think it was my mom or father, I think it was father, um, you know, he's sick and he needs, would you go by his house and pray for him? He's like, sure, because, you know, pastors pray for people. A person, a friend of someone. Okay, so he's sure. He got the address, right? He was ignorant of the address and he followed the address. Got there, showed up at a gate because there was a gated community, you know. There's plenty of gated communities, right? In Florida, for sure. And so anyway, he drives up. Well, all of a sudden, you know, he, you know, says, you know, what he needs to do. And then the guard who worked for the place said, uh, a guy drives up, rides up on a bike naked, it was a nudist colony. He said, oh, I know where he lives. Just follow me. <laughs> so he said, here I am following a guy on a bike naked. <laughs> he said, it's pastor. <laughs> He's like, he, you know, I kept my word. <laughs> he said, I just felt like I had blinders on the whole time. He said, I didn't look to the right or to the left, man. I just <laughs> got to the house, prayed for the person, looking in their eyes and then left the neighborhood as quickly as I could, right? No, but you understand, people are goofy. I'm telling you, people are goofy because they do not rightly divide the word of truth. I mean, you understand, I could sell you all kind of false stuff in Scripture. Well, if we're back in the original purpose of man and man's in the garden, then we're in the garden and we were free and, no, and they weren't wearing any clothes. We were unashamed. So we can all come here together unashamed. Yeah, right. It's not true. Come on. It's not true. Quit looking at people. Stop it. Stop it. Right. And don't listen to that. If you're ever going to do public speaking, just imagine everybody naked. Don't do that. That's, that's worse. It's like, I can't even preach now. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Uh, but it's will. You decide. Say, I decide. I decide. You are in control. Yes. So no one can control you. You're in control. Now, you can be in places where they limit your ability to do. And most of those places that are really tight is called prison. Now, in prison, they tell you what to wear, what to eat, and when, their movement. But even in prison, there's some liberty. But again, a prisoner 
can still choose to either be in the general population or they can even rebel against what layers of boundaries are set there and find themselves in solitary confinement. They didn't have to be in solitary confinement, but because they will not get along well with the general population. So there's still a matter of choice even in prison. But if you're not in prison, you understand your job doesn't control you because you could quit. Your spouse doesn't control you. You could get a divorce. You could. Are you hearing me? Getting pregnant doesn't even control you. There are people who make choices to not be pregnant anymore. Are you hearing me? If you are speeding in the police officers, you can choose to either pull over or keep driving faster. (laughs) Right? So it's kind of crazy when people are always acting like people are trying to control my life and then begin to get on social media and talk about the abuses that are happening in the workplace or, you know, among their family especially when it comes to church, you know, because, you know, pastors are the most controlling people on the face of the planet, apparently. But the reality is no one's controlling you. You control your own life. Even right now, I don't control you listening. Because don't think there's not been plenty of people that while I'm preaching, some are like, praise the Lord, Thank you, Lord, and are receiving the engrafted word and renewing their mind. And others are like, I don't believe that. I'm not going to do that. But yet smiling the whole time. <laughs> Hallelujah. And there are some that even run down and shout, but then on Monday, cur- cuss. Well, what happened to Sunday, you? <laughs> Where's the Sunday person? It's your choice. Yeah. Well, you know, at work, you know, they made me. Nobody's making you. I said, nobody's making you. Nobody's making you. And you know, in the United States, you really have no say so. It's not like you're in these dictator countries. And even then, the dictator countries, there's still the ability to choose. Because you can choose to go against the dictator and just leave the planet quicker. (laughs) Right? I mean, you could do that. Just say amen. Amen. But why do people want to put the control card on others? It's because they don't want to take the responsibility of their own choice. They want to accept the lie. And you know what it came from? The believer saying God is in control. Because if God can do something to me that I don't want, if God forces, if God's making the choices in my life, and I'm basically walking down those paths, period. Well, then you understand it's easy to put that on anyone else. Well, the reality is God lets you take your own path. Now, how do we know this? Let's, let's destroy a little, little false doctrine here. First John 1 John 1.5 says this. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is what? Light, and in him there is what? There is what? There is what? No darkness at? No darkness at? No darkness at? So God is what? Now, Colossians says that he redeemed us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of of the son of light, his beloved son or the, uh, the son of light. So darkness is associated with evil and disobedience and rebellion, and light is associated with life. And he says there's no rebellion in God. There's no evil in God. In fact, Jesus said it this way in John 14, 30. He said, I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. He has what? Nothing. So you understand, one particular thing we see all the time is the yin and the yang. The yin and the yang, you know, it stands that in everything evil, there's a little bit of good, and everything good, there's a little bit of evil. And so we actually think God's all good, but yet he can dabble in darkness if he chooses 
because he's in control and his ways are higher than your ways. And we've accepted that as truth, but that's conflicting because how can a holy God and a just God play with the devil? In fact, how can he employ him? If, if the devil's on his payroll, It's on his payroll. Are you hearing me? Now, again, <laughs> let me read James first, and then I'm going to deal with your Job and false doctrine. James 1, 12 to 15 says this, Blessed is a man who perseveres under what? Under trial. What's he do? He perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive what? The crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who what? Let no one say when he is what? Tempted. I am being tempted by God. For God what? Cannot be tempted by evil. Well, if he can't be tempted by evil and in him is no darkness and the God of this world or the ruler of this world has nothing in him, so there's nothing in God that uses evil to teach you a lesson. I don't know why the Lord let me get in a wreck. The Lord didn't let you get in a wreck. The Lord was not the author of your wreck. There is a devil that comes to Still, it's amazing. We want to give all the devil's weapons and his warfare attributed to God. I know, we know that God is ultimately the source of authority and his will reigns supreme. But there are other forces and there's other humans that are functioning of their own free will and they're trying to thwart and come against God's ultimate will. And God can take uh, the will of someone against him that can come against you. So in essence, what the devil meant for bad, God can turn for good. But he wasn't the author of what the devil brought. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot tempt by evil, for he himself does not tempt anyone. Now notice this comes off of verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. I mean, this is how powerful God's word is. The minute he makes you know the answer, he doesn't care if something comes against you. Because he's already giving you the power to overcome. God never told Adam, hey, um, son, we tight. And you know I love you, right? Look at all this fruit I've given you. It's pretty awesome, right? And you know you can't eat this tree. This tree right here, son, you don't eat it, right? I've told you that. Don't eat this tree. You'll die. I've said this to you. Every time I come to the garden, I tell you that. I just remind you. But listen, um, where your daddy lives, I had a problem. I take care of problems. Um, but I cast one of these created beings I had out. And I'll be honest with you, I think he's coming to see you. I just want you to know. That way when he shows up, you'll be ready. He never told him that. Never. Never. You think, why in the world would the father not warn his son? Well, how in the world can Adam die, no matter who shows up? There's only one way to die for Adam. It's to eat the fruit. Tempting, being tempted won't kill him. <clears throat> being tempted won't kill him. Because Jesus was tempted on all accounts like us. But he didn't sin. Now, he became sin. He didn't willfully divulge in rebellion. He took on what he resisted his whole existence because he did the will of his father. So he didn't never warn him that he was coming. He just said, don't eat this tree. So you understand why the devil comes in and is like, I got to figure out what God said. Because his will is what he supports. And if you go against his will, then you get the alternative. And so I got to find out what his will is. I need to know what his will is. Let me ask Eve. Let me just ask Eve. Let me see if I can get it out of her. 
And she lets him know, no, we can eat from any tree of the garden, bro. Just this tree right here, we can't eat because the day we eat, we're going to die. And he's like, that's it, that's it, that's it. Okay, okay, I'm going to tempt them with what? Evil. I am going to tempt them. Not the God. And God didn't send him. The same power that God had Adam possess in the earth, he could have cast the devil out of his realm. But instead, he chose to rebel against his own father. It was his choice. That's why Romans 5 says it's through one man's transgression, not because of the temptation, but because of the choice. So when we get over into then, and let's go on, he said, but the one who is tempted is carried away and enticed by his own lust. So there was something that fabricated in, because you understand when God created the anointed cherub that we call Satan today, he didn't put any evil in him. He conceived that himself. He started to lust. And then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth what? Death. Death. So in Adam, he began to lust for a power that was never his. And he made the choice to act on it because he thought he could get it. But in turn, he just gave his authority over to the devil. The devil usurped, in essence, through deception, was able to receive freely from Adam. Not stealing but receive freely through manipulation and deception the power of dominion over the earth. That's why he was called, is called the God of this world or the systems that are on it. That's why Jesus called him the ruler of this world. It's not the earth, it's the systems. In essence, he is functioning in the systems. He's established those systems because he's Lord, he's king over them. But I've come to destroy the works of the devil. Can I get an amen? And he wants to bring God's kingdom back. So, if you jump back over into Job, and you can study this for yourself, when you're reading the account, and you read these other accounts, you have to know then God himself is not wanting to destroy Job. It's not God's will that he loses his kids, loses his livestock. The enemy comes to the Lord in the heaven realm because he is the God of the world. And the Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? He's a righteous guy. The devil did. Satan did. And he begins to say, yeah, he's blessed all right. You sure are blessing him, but if you take the things you've given him. Now, what gave the devil rights anyway? Well, what was Job doing? He was very concerned that his kids may sin against God. So he was doing sacrifices for them. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He was doing sacrifices for them in hopes that in the event that their kids did something and they died, that they could make it into God or be with God. In essence, he was trying to be the sacrifice for his own kids, but his kids had opened the door themselves. And so it gave him, gave him the right, and it said he feared this. He was afraid. Very concerned that his kids weren't living according to the will of God, the known will of God at the time. It gave an open door for the devil to come and kill his kids, kill what they were responsible for, which was his livestock. They oversaw a lot of his stuff. They were responsible. He was able to destroy all that stuff in hopes that he would begin to think God as a bad person. Now, he never called God evil. And it was obvious he did not have any context of Satan like we do. We've been given letters and context of Satan, which is why he said the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Why? Because he is not aware of the entity or the person called the devil, but we are not ignorant of him. Again, you understand somebody can do something for you and you're unaware of it. I mean, I've gone to restaurants, somebody paid for my meal, I have no idea who did it. Now, I could just say, well, the Lord blessed me, the Lord paid for it. Well, the Lord ultimately did in one sense, but he did it through a human being, right? Right? So again, when he's making the statement, it's in his ignorance. The whole book of Job is him trying to understand why all this befell, but would befall him when he's been living righteous in the first place. 
You say, well, what about the sickness? Man was made out of the dust of the earth. And Adam had a, a dominion over all the earth. So when he says, if you touch the man's skin, if you get sickness on him, he'll curse you to your face. And what did God say? He's within your power. Both times he said that. He's within your power. Meaning, but he, he limited what he could do to Job's suit. He said, because he's righteous, you can't put a sickness on him that he would die where his spirit would have to leave. He's done nothing deserving of physical death. So you cannot put anything on him that would cause him to die. So God limited what the tempter could do because of the righteousness of Job. And we say God's in control. Now again, when the scripture in Job says, you've tempted me to move upon my servant Job, all he's saying is, is you're trying to have me come against him, but I'm not, he's within your power. But I'll still protect him. Because you've given the condition, Satan, that based upon what's in your power, if you come to kill, steal, and destroy it, he will curse me. I don't believe he'll curse me. He's a righteous man. Just like I don't want Adam to eat the fruit. But it still will be Job's choice. But you know what? Job always chose to maintain righteousness. And everything the three friends came and said, he rebuked them. In fact, they had to do a sacrifice and get Job to pray for them. But after it was all said and done, what did God do to Job? Because of the trouble the devil brought. I'm giving you double for your trouble. He got double the kids, meaning he got the same amount on earth because the other three had already died, which means then there was something that happened in the process that they were still a candidate to be with the Lord. I can't tell you what that is. All right? So with that being said, turn over to Romans chapter 9. I'm going to have to start in verse 1. And I didn't, I put this, I, I, I put this technically as just Roman 9 because there are verses in here I need to go to. And even this morning, I'm like, Lord, I need some clarity here because I need to be able to explain this with clarity. I need to explain this with clarity because this is the issue. This is the chapter everybody goes to and says God's in control. God's in control. God's in. Well, God is in control of his word. He will control his word because his word is him, is who he is, and it's the highest word, period. But we get to choose whether or not we get to do it. And if you don't choose God's word, you get the alternative. His word is life. So if you don't choose his word, what do you get? Death. And who decides death? Who decides death? And this is in any situation in your life. You decide it. Okay? But let's start in verse 1, because verse 1 sets context. I said verse 1 sets context. Paul says this. Look what Paul says. He says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. Verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Next verse, for I could wish that I myself were cursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kins, kinsmen, according to the flesh who are Israelites to whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple uh, service and the promises. Whose are the fathers and from whom in the, in, is in Christ according to the flesh oh, who is over all God bless forever. Amen. Verse six. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. And I'll stop right there. Now, what's important about this passage, so leave it up so I can kind of go to it. What sets context of chapter 9 is Paul's opening statement. He is saying, if I could take the responsibility of the choice of every one of my kinsmen, that I could bear that responsibility and some of their choices, 
so that it's me who will be eternally separated from Christ forever. And by doing that, although it was their choice, I'm taking that choice. And if that could happen, I would gladly do it so all of them could be with Christ. If I could be their will, if I could just somehow be the one who took on all of their choices and God accounted their choices to me so that the choices they make aren't accounted to them, then I do it because I have this grief. I want them to be in Christ. But what does he conclude? You can't. If there was a way possible that the will of man could be overturned and they could be with Christ independent of their choices, I'd be the first one to take it on. Now you say, why would he do that? Well, he's really demonstrating the heart of Jesus in one sense because Jesus, although he can't take on your choice, he can take on your sin, which by all rights is your choice, meaning he took on your wrongdoing, he's paid the price for death so that you can now, being born of God, born of him, and the reigning spirit lives in you, can always choose to side with God's word, live the life that has life, and no longer make the choice of wrong. But you still have to make the choice. So what Jesus could do for us, he did, which means I will pay the payment for the sum of all your choices. However, you still have to choose me. Because here's the thing. Has Jesus died for the sin of all humanity? Has he done it once and for all? Does he ever have to go back to the cross? No, he's done it. So before we were ever thought of in a womb, in the natural, God already paid for the sum total of all of our sins that we would ever commit while we were on the planet. Yet, we cannot be born again. Although the blood has been applied to our sin. It is forever settled in heaven. How is it that we get the blood applied to our account so that we can become a new creature in Christ? We choose of our own free will to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and the substitute of our payment, the one who paid the price of all of our wrongdoing. And when we make that choice, we become born again. At that point, we begin to do everything in life still based upon choice. It's just now we're attached to life and our spirit man is no longer dead, separated from God, who the, some choices of a spirit separated from God is only death because we are eternally rebellious. Now we've been empowered with the choice of life. And we can choose life. I said we can choose life. We can choose life. Now, the reason why this is important, if you jump down to verse 13, as he begins to deal with some things, it says this, and it was written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? Paul answers it. May it never be. I love Jacob, hate Esau. Okay. That's <laughs> why so I have problems with the stupid billboards that say God's not mad at you. God hates sin. God hates rebellion. God's giving you a way out. But if you keep doing it, wrath is being stored up for those in disobedience. So to give the world this idea that God's happy with them. We have bought this lie that if we don't tell them what's wrong, then inevitably the wrong just disappears. Again, Robert can go to the doctor and he can say, I found this. Well, that doesn't move the covenant child. Thank you for letting me know now that I know I can speak to it and do something. Because if I was ignorant of it, it could have taken over my whole body, brought me, took me out. And I, all the while, I'm like, I didn't know. Again, if the doctor said, well, 
Robert, you know, I feel like he's a little bit older and, you know, he's probably lived a good enough life. We'll just, I don't want him to have a hard time the rest of his life. You know, I'm just not going to tell him. Robert, you know, you got some high blood pressure. That's, you know, we'll, we'll deal with that and deal with different symptoms and don't even tell him what's going on. Man, you're looking good today, all the while knowing he's got cancer. And we're telling the world, God's not mad at you. God's mad at sin. God hates sin. God hates the sinner. It's like we've tried to separate the spirit of a person from themselves. I mean, a sinner functions in sin. I mean, a person dead, separated from God, is a sinner. In fact, Jesus called them, their father was the devil, not him. Now, their original creation was in the image of God. But the minute they sinned, they fell from that dominion. They no longer have the life of God. And their father, by all right, is the devil. And God does not love the devil. And that's not being mean. That's saying, we have an answer. We have an answer. Well, you think you're better than me. I don't think I'm better than you. I'm alive. And you're dying. Period. I just saw one minister do this. He took a, um, a goldfish bowl, put it on the sanctuary, uh, on a stage, and he took the, one of the fish out and put it on the table and walked away. And it started flapping, and it fell off the table, and they gasped. And he picked it back up and stuck it back on the table. And he says, this fish is dying right now. And everybody's just shocked. And then he picks it up and throws it back, and he says, you're more concerned about this fish dying than your neighbor who's dying. If they're not born again, they're dying. If they're not born again, God is going to, his wrath's being stored up from them, and you have the answer to get them out of it, but yet you don't want to offend them. We don't even want to give them a right diagnosis. We don't even want to give them an opportunity. Look, if Robert chooses, I don't care, I'm going out this way, God can't even stop it. God can't stop it. God won't stop it. But at least he now has the he wasn't robbed of the choice. We shouldn't rob people of the choice to get over into life. But he goes on and says this, okay, uh, Jacob, I love you, Esau, I hated. What shall we say then? Is there no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he, who, uh, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on who I have mercy, and I have compassion on who I have compassion. So it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. That is really kind of unclear, man, when you first read it. But again, we're talking in context of Paul saying, now, if I could take on all their choices so that when they make their choices, it doesn't matter and they get to be with God because I'm the choice, I take the choices. But he's like, I can't do it. They have to make their own choice. In essence, what he's saying is, is that God knows some things. And this is the problem. That's why I titled the message, Known, Not Made. Just because God has knowledge doesn't mean he's going to make you. Because God actually already knows the sum, choice, sum total of all your choices. But they're still your choices. And God's word is going to come to pass because God's eternal. He's very patient. Which means God can say, I'll wait till a spirit raises up that will obey me so that that objective can be accomplished in the earth. And if there's a generation of nobody obeying, he'll wait till one comes around where someone will, of their own free will, say, I'll choose to obey God and it'll keep moving his plan forward. Oh, y'all. God is on an eternal timeline. So at the end of the day, what God says is going to come to pass, he is patient for a spirit that he has placed in the womb, in the earth, to be able to fully be persuaded that his word is his word, and he'll use that person to continue to propel his word forward. 
although it's not God making them do it, it is God knowing that it is their choice to do it and he's influenced them to make the choice and of their free will, they do it. So just because God can prophesy about a John the Baptist before he ever shows up, there's a voice crying in the wilderness, Isaiah said. He knew that when the opportunity that I influence this guy, this child that's going to come into the womb of Martha, when that spirit hits him, he will of his own free will do my will. But it's still him. So he goes on and says, so then it doesn't depend on the will of man, which means this, God is saying, it's at my word things are coming to pass. And it's not by a man's will by himself, it's a man submitting his will to God's will. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this, look at this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed through the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. That's misleading when you just read it by itself if you don't know what he's saying. You will say to them, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? Well, you understand that? That's a very good question. Because if God's in control, well, then how could he find fault if he makes you do wrong? if he makes someone else do wrong by you. So he's trying to set context here. In essence, in fact, when it comes to Pharaoh, you'll read it, if you go over to Exodus, it says, then a Pharaoh rose up that did not know Joseph. Now that's a very powerful statement that we gloss over all the time. What it's saying there is that all the exploits of Joseph and how it was heralded from that Pharaoh that brought Joseph on, that saved Egypt, and acknowledged that his God was God. Although they didn't quit serving gods, but they understood the God of Joseph, there was still something in the land about the God of Joseph. Finally, a Pharaoh came up that had no testimony of that and had no concern, and in fact, he was so dedicated to his gods and so resistant and then began to pressure the Israelites, made them a slave. Had his own self-interest. Why did he make them slaves anyway? They were productive without it. They were bringing a blessing to the nation without it. No, he didn't want them to side with another kingdom and come up and overthrow his kingdom. So through selfish ambition and self-preservation, he made them slaves. He forced, he controlled them the best he could. Now again, he may control their movement, but he doesn't control their mind. They have to give that. I got got to go on. I got to go on. So my point is, is that when Moses shows up, he says, I'll harden his heart. Well, how did God do that? If you just understand scripture, how's he going to harden Pharaoh's heart? There's one way hearts are hardened. It's very consistent in scripture. It is when the word is spoken to you and you resist it, you harden your heart. Even right now in this room, you can harden your heart by what I'm saying. And that word can either soften you so that you get your mind renewed to it and you begin to let the life of God, or you can keep entertaining your own will and your own thoughts of what you want it to be through the lenses you want it. And when I say something that can set you free, from your own thought pattern, but you love it more than God's, as the, the prophetic word came forth, you like that throne more. Then, all of a sudden, you harden your heart. How did he harden? He said, go to Pharaoh and tell him, God's, the Lord said, let my people go. He said, let my people go. And what would Pharaoh say? I don't even know your God. He didn't say, well, I got quite a few gods myself. Who's yours since you're telling me he said something? Right? I mean, the guy's got a lot of gods anyway, pretty confused. So, you know, what's another one? But then he, he is so adamant against it. He, when Moses leaves, he says, you make it worse on those guys so that what this guy has just told me, to them, they'll think it's a lie. 
And that's what deception will do. Deception tries to make what truth is a lie in the hearer's voice. And Moses had already went to the nation of Israel and say, the Lord has sent me. He wants to deliver you. We're going to come up out of Egypt. And they're like, whoa, you're the man, Moses. We love you, Moses. Go tell Pharaoh. Go kick him, man. Let's do this thing. Right? Moses came back and he said, what did he say? Well, he said he wasn't going to let y'all go. And then they end up having to do a worse labor. And now they're mad at Moses. Like, you need to take yourself back to your sheep, bro. Just you need to leave town. But Moses is like, nah, I'll just do the will of God anyway. So he keeps showing up. Every time he shows up to Pharaoh, he says, the Lord said. Every time he comes to Pharaoh, he says, the Lord said. Every time he comes to Pharaoh, he says, the Lord said. How do we know there's a hardening of heart? What did the Lord say about the Israelites when they're wandering in the wilderness? He said, why are they stiff-necked and hard of heart? Every time I tell them what I'm going to do, they don't do it. So you understand? Some of the places where it's the most difficult... Is church. Because the minute you decide you take everything I say personal and not examining it as the word of God. Oh man, last week at Rama, man, I was I was sliced bread. I mean, they just don't know. Oh, that's Pastor Earl Glisson. Oh, I heard you were in town. I came to listen. Well, they ever, I told them, I told the class, I said, everybody loves me till I correct them. But in the words, you're going to correct people. You know, and as long as I travel around and don't correct and I just tell them how, who they are in Christ and how they can walk in the kingdom and give them these great words, they're like, wow, they're so amazing, they're so great. Right? Then you're awesome. You hit, people get healed through your ministry, whatever the case, which is God doing it all, but you know, they equate you. Amen. And then it means you correct somebody. Right. Now all of a sudden, <laughs> they're waiting for you to blow it because they want you to blow it now so they can tell everybody you've blown it. And everything you're saying to set them free, they just harden their heart. More and more and more. And it's not God doing it. It's you doing it by resisting his word. So when he is talking about these particular things, he is saying, I've raised up a Pharaoh to show my power because I just happen to know that every time my word comes, he's going to resist it. And I'm coming now to deliver my people because they have got accustomed to the gods of Egypt. And they know I'm out there. They've started crying out to me. And so I'm going to demonstrate to them, because if they're going to be firmly persuaded in me, they got to know that I'm greater than the God of Ra, the God of the sun, and all the other gods that they worshipped in Egypt. That's why the plagues personally attacked what those gods were known for. It was God declaring to his nation, I am supreme. And it's not that I didn't give the guy an opportunity to let you go at my word. But when you resist my word, I have no problem giving you the alternative. So Pharaoh brought destruction to his nation. Through the sum total of his choices. That's why his people let her on said, man, let them go, bro. Let them go. Y'all all right? Yeah. With that being said, look at Hebrews chapter 4. We'll wind down a little bit. So we can carry it into next week. He again fixes a certain day, um, Hebrews 4, 7. He again fixes a certain day today saying through David, after so long, a time just as it has been said before, today if you hear his voice and do not harden your hearts, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his work as God did his from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same examples of what? disobedience. So we could, we could sum this up pretty quick. 
in one statement, and that is, you want a perpetual Sabbath? Always be doing the will of God. You'll constantly in a rest. Jesus was accused often of working on the Sabbath, the actual day. But he's like, look, the Sabbath was not set up for God. It was set up for man. And that's to put you in remembrance who's, who's, who you're supposed to be listening to. And he says, my father's always working. That's kind of crazy. I thought he's resting. Well, he's working in the context that he's performing his word. And Jesus has said, I'm doing the same thing. I'm here to do the Father's will. And he was doing stuff on the Sabbath day. Did he heal people? They were miffed that on the Sabbath, he had the audacity to heal somebody. And there are churches right now, people who are letting, well, you know, we're going to take a Sabbath. Sabbath Sunday. I mean, you want to get perpetual rest, just obey. Now, that doesn't mean you won't have a rest day because if you're following God, he'll say, you need to take a day off. Your body needs the rest, or whatever the case may be. But I'm not going to get into all that. Let's go on to verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, above joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So what does this? The word. What does this? The word. What does the word do? It pierces. It pierces soul from the spirit and from both joints and marrow. That is spirit, soul, and body. What does it? The word. Now turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 says it this way. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The power for you on all three levels of your being to be all that it can be rests in your choice. And here's the thing, is that we can be very proficient at controlling an area of our life, but yet not controlling the other areas. There have been people that I've met that when you look at their physical suit, they are disciplined. They control what goes in their mouth, They control how often it goes in their mouth. They control the regiment of their exercise. Are you hearing me? And their body produces the fruit of it. But in their soul realm, emotionally, they are whacked out. Out of control. Their bodies are as fit as they can be, but they're sleeping with everything. Because they have no control in their soul realm. They're letting other things influence them. Now, when I say no control, they actually are controlling it. They just haven't submitted it to God's will. Here's the thing. Most of us, we only want to submit our spirit to God. And not our soul. That's why there's a lot of churches that know they're going to heaven, but they live like hell on earth. And then they act like God's allowing it to happen because he's in control. He's in control of what your body looks like. He's in control of your emotional state. He's in control of how educated you are. He's controlling what all your jobs are. But, you know, at least I'm going to heaven when I die. Yet it's our responsibility It says that God may a peace sanctify you entirely and may your spirit be preserved complete. Well, if God was in control, don't you think he would put all those perfect? None of us should have diabetes. None of us should have any health issues. We should have no problems in our emotional state or mental state at all. Yet there are. We'll close with this scripture. It got quiet. Well, everybody was happy. 
We're doing good. I guess I should have stopped 30 minutes ago. Galatians 5, start in verse 16. Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, says, But I say to the church, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Who's in control? Because if God is in control, how in the world could you ever carry out the desires of the flesh? And he's talking to born-again people. I mean, really, he's rebuking this whole church. This is one rebuke letter. This whole letter is a rebuke letter. I don't know that they ever invited him back to preach. <laughs> it's just one big rebuke. From chapter one all the way through, he's rebuking. Although he's, you know, giving instruction, trying to tell them, hey, come on now, guys, let's get this together, right? But he said, now, if you walk by the Spirit, but I say walk, in essence, that word walk is implication, you've got to do it. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For those uh, are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Now, again, you can do whatever you want to do. It's the large, if you walk by the reigning Spirit, in essence, if you'll yield your will to the reigning Spirit's will, then you will not carry out the desires of the flesh that wage war against your soul. He goes on and says, but if you are led, if you are what? If is a conditional statement. This is a born again, sanctified, completely righteous, made in the likeness of Christ, believer in the spirit. Yet, if you don't do this, then you get the alternative. And it's not God's fault. Because God is not controlling you. God has empowered you. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit. You are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things of the like, of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, so that those who what? Practice. Those who what? Practice. Those who what? Practice. Those who what? Practice. That means they're doing this. They're doing it. You know what? They're in immorality. They're doing sensuality. They're gossiping. They have strife. They have outbursts of anger. They're all, this is just like part of their life. This is how they live. I mean, this is like common occurrence with them. He says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, we are given massive passes. Instead of saying, are you born again? Well, yeah. What are you doing? Well, don't judge me, bro. That stuff don't get in the kingdom. Because our God's not a God of injustice. You don't get born again and keep living like your old way. That's not God. His ways are not higher than our ways where he gives you the ability to habitually sin yet still make it into the kingdom. His blood does not give you the right to be like the devil and still make it to heaven. No, but if you're led by the spirit, you won't do any of those. Which means the spirit's going to say, don't go to sleep with them. Don't say that. Y'all ready for this? But the fruit of the Spirit is, come on, say love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self, 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 self. It's a fruit of the Spirit. You know what the Spirit says? He says, I can't control you, but I, you can control yourself. He says, you know what one of my fruits is? Is I control myself. That's why I'm holy. That's why I'm righteous. That's why I'm light. I know how to control myself. Now I'm going to give you a piece of my fruit. You control yourself. Quit blaming people. I don't care where you were born, what color you are, what track you were on. 
I don't care how you came into existence. He'll want to give you some self-control that you can live the life of God, the best life ever. But you've got to decide to do it. You have to take the responsibility. I said, you have to take the responsibility. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk. And who controls that? You do by your will. Let's pray.